This is Thursday, November 19th, 2015. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Molly McLaughlin. Welcome, Molly. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? July 4th, 1967. And where were you born? Corvallis, Oregon. And what community do you currently live? Marion, Massachusetts. Your marital status? I am divorced. And do you have children? Yes, I do. I have two. I understand that you lived in Corvallis for a short time. Correct. Before your family moved to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and that your father served in the Air Force. That's correct. And can you tell us a little more about your father's career in the Air Force? Um, sure. So he joined in the early 60s um, and he was a um, missile leader, uh, mostly with nu the nuclear warheads. Um, so he served 14 years on active duty um, all around uh, nuclear mm -hmm. uh, programs. Um, and after the downsizing post-Vietnam War, he was rifted out of the Air Force and joined the reserves as an enlisted soldier. What was it like growing up in a military family during the Vietnam War? I don't think we noticed that it was any different than anything else. So, I mean, it was our norm. Um, you know, Dad was gone a lot because he, when he would go on duty, he would be gone for three, four days in the missile silos. Um, so that was interesting because he was a widow, widower. <laughs> widower. Mm -hmm. um, my, my mother, Margaret Mary, passed away in 1970. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, so when he was gone, we had a um, nanny that watched us and cared for us. And surprisingly, the Air Force was quite supportive of it. Um, even, you wouldn't think so mm -hmm. in the 70s, but they were actually. So it was, like I said, I think it was our norm, so we really didn't know. Um, we, I guess I thought everybody moved around every three to four years. <laughs> Where else did you live besides Cheyenne? Uh, we lived in um, McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, um, and then we um, lived in upstate New York outside of Fort Drum in a town called Lowville. And then we lived in um, New Orleans for three years, and then I went to high school in Fredonia, New York. You did bounce around. Sure did. And do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I have one brother and three sisters. Um, two are biological, two are um, adoptive. You're in high school in Fredonia, New York. Did you have any leanings toward entering the military? Oh, I knew way before that that I wanted to serve. Mm -hmm. um, I, my dad, I think, wanted all of us to serve, and I was the only one um, that agreed with him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, did you go in after high school? Um, well, I went to Norwich University. Norwich. Okay. Um, and my freshman year, I had a three-year Air Force scholarship, um, and um, there was a boy involved, and he convinced me that I wasn't suited for the Air Force. Um, and so I gave my scholarship up, and I joined the Vermont National Guard um, on April 4th, 1986, and served the remainder of my college years in the Vermont National Guard until I was commissioned mm -hmm. from Norwich um, into the Army, into the Signal Corps. When I was enlisted, I was an air traffic controller. Tell us a little more about that. So I, um, I was in an aviation unit um, at the Burlington Airport, um, and we were there was a platoon of air traffic controllers. I was um, the tower chief for the tactical tower. Um, so I was able to go to air assault school um, and do a lot of pathfinder operations, setting up airfields um, during operations in the middle of um, nowhere in Vermont, really, <laughs> um, on, on top of mountains and in very, very remote places. Um, so we would re, we would sling load the tower and repel out and set up a airfield and um, out of nothing. So it was quite cool. It's probably one of the funnest jobs I've ever had in the Army. <laughs> Safe to say that this was for military aircraft? <laughs> yes, it was helicopters. And bouncing around from Vermont it's not the worst thing in the world to do. No, it's quite gorgeous. Mm -hmm. 
When did you receive your commission? May 19, 1989. Okay. And now you're a second lieutenant. You're a Norwich graduate. You're in the Army. Oh, by the way, how did your father feel about you being in the Army instead of the mm. Air Force? He didn't talk to me for about two months. Oh. He was very upset. Um, and he, you know, he still gives me a hard time about it. <laughs> 29 or 30 years later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lieutenant, tell us what happened next. So I had a break um, between when I graduated college and when I went on active duty because they were backlogged in the Signal Corps um, for second lieutenants going to OBC. So I worked as a chemist um, and an industrial hygienist for a asbestos abatement lab in Boston for the summer. Actually, it ended up being three, four months, and then um, I was waiting tables to um, gave up my apartment, moved in with my boyfriend's parents in Falmouth, and waited tables at the Captain Kidd in Woods Hole, and that was a lot of fun. It was kind of, you know, carefree, <laughs> a carefree time in my life. Just just before I started on active duty, um, I joined active duty on uh, the 11th of November, 1989. Um, went to OBC in Fort Gordon, Georgia. And OBC stands for? Officer Basic Course. Okay. Um, so I went to um, Officer Basic Course at Fort Gordon, followed on Battalion Brigade Signal Officer Course at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And from there I went to Korea. So my first duty assignment was with the uh, 523 MI Battalion, which is part of the 501st MI Brigade, um, and I was at Zeckler Station in Camp Humphreys in Pyeongtaek, Korea. Okay, you're in Korea with uh, MI is military intelligence? It is, but I was a signal officer. Okay, so tell me a little more about being a signal officer. Well, I, at first when I found out my branch, I didn't know what it was <laughs> because I had asked for combat arms, um, aviation. Um, uh, aviation was my branch originally, but they changed a requirement for arm reach or arm length, and I got disqualified. And so they switched my to the Signal Corps because they were short officers. Um, it, at the time, I really I tried to get out of my contract because I didn't want to go in the Signal Corps. Um, and looking back, it was it was hard for me because I wanted to be combat arms and. Um, not being able to get your branch is, is tough. So um, I still paid attention, and in hindsight, the Signal Corps has been great for me. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I was mad at the Army um, because I wanted to be a pilot. Mm -hmm. And I petitioned six times to go to flight school, and they denied my claim um, for three centimeters of arm reach. Three centimeters? Oh, oh my goodness. But let's, uh, let's kind of step back a little bit, because here you are, woman officer, you're in the Army, it's not, it's sort of like the last bit of peacetime before Persian go. But the, what, was the, um, what was the overall attitude toward women officers at that time? Um, I, I think that depending on where you went, it was, you know, women in the military in general were still not overly accepted. Um, I think that they had the attitude that you were there to find a husband <laughs> mm -hmm. or you were gay um, and this was the only way you could find employment. So it was, it was interesting um, to be a heterosexual, not interested in getting married right away. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it, you know, just, it, was, it was hard to get people to look at you objectively. And, uh, but I think, you know, performance is performance and it's not, it's not, you can't argue performance. And, but you, you definitely had to prove yourself more than your peers that were men. You had to do better. You had to run faster. You had to work harder just to get the same acknowledgement mm -hmm. um, as your peers. So, you know, it, it kind of sucked, okay. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> All right. So let's get you back to Korea with the 523rd signal officer. and As a platoon leader. As a platoon leader. Mm -hmm. I had uh, 65 men and women that worked for me. Um, 
being MI and Signal Corps, both are um, branches that women are allowed in, always have been, since women were in the Army. Um, so there is, you know, there were plenty of us in, in those roles. Um, the mission of the platoon was to provide tactical comms for the uh, theater, the senior theater military intelligence officer. Mm -hmm. And where in Korea were you based? Um, Pyeongtaek, Pyeongtaek, Camp Humphreys. How far were you from the border with North Korea? Um, actually, fairly far, probably about a two hour drive, maybe three. Mm -hmm. With Korean traffic, it might be five. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Um, but no, it was below Seoul. Mm -hmm. um, but we had missions along. I did have soldiers at listening post on the DMZ that I used to have to switch out. Um, I had soldiers at CP Tango, which was the mountain that's hollowed out in the um, go to war headquarters mm -hmm. for um, the command elements within Korea. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of what we did, and processing top-secret mm -hmm. uh, information that was transferred via uh, my, my platoon from all the way from the DMZ to Seoul down to Zeckler Station and CP Tango. And how long were you stationed in Korea? Fifteen months. And how would you describe your experience in Korea? It was, um, it was a time where I realized that I didn't have a lot else going on um, because I was remotely located from my company. Um, so I had a lot of uh, freedom, I should say, and not a lot of supervision. Um, and I started getting, I started, I went and started taking master level classes. Um, at Osan Air Force Base and really learning what it was like to be an officer, you know, completely failing. <laughs> uh, luckily I had a really good platoon sergeant who would pick me up by my collar and straighten me out and say, well, we're not that way ma'am, this way. And um, he taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. He was really uh, quite, quite good at saying, yeah, not so much ma'am, that's not going to work. How about we try it this way? Um, you know, when I would have the good idea ferry and he would say, no, that's not, that's not right. Uh, would you like to mention the name of this platoon sergeant? Uh, Sergeant First Class Wilson. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember his first name. Hopefully he'll be listening. <laughs> Very possible. He'll be seeing this. <laughs> okay, so you are uh, spent 15 months in Korea and uh, how did you like the culture, the people? I, I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was one of the things that, uh, you know, you had people that were barracks rats, they stayed in the barracks, they never left post. And then you had the people that only left post to go out to the bars. Um, but for me, it was, I, I tried to see as much of this, the country as I could when mm -hmm. I was there. Um, I spent a lot of time on tours, MWR tours. And um, at, one, at some point, um, one of my friends became my boyfriend. And uh, we got engaged on the island of Jeju-do, which is off the, co the southern mm -hmm. coast of Korea. Um, he was a fellow soldier. I take it the other boyfriend you mentioned earlier was not in the picture anymore. No, he was just he was just a good friend. Okay. <laughs> you no, know, he's yeah, he's still a good friend. Okay, so you got you got engaged. I got engaged. Yes. Then what happened? And so. Um, we were both getting out of country about the same time because they had kind of stopped lost um, because of the war in um, Iraq. So we got out of country about the same time um, and changed our duty assignments to be the same and ended up in uh, Fort Bliss in uh, El Paso, Texas. And about what year was this now? So it would have been 91. Gulf War. <laughs> right, and I, I was assigned to the 143 Air Defense Artillery Patriot Battalion. Mm -hmm. 193? 143. 143, okay, thank you. Patriot Missile? Correct. And are you still a second lieutenant? No, I had gotten promoted to first lieutenant by this time. 
while I was in Korea. And what were your duties with the 143? Um, I was a platoon leader again and okay. the ComSec custodian, um, communication securities custodian. And I had um, roughly 70 soldiers and um, a very weak platoon sergeant originally. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily he PCS'd quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, I then got a, a fairly good one after that. And we spent a lot of time in, in the desert mm -hmm. training. Lots of time. <laughs> <laughs> Little change from Korea. Yes. You know, kind of on a war footing, were you being, were you expected to head were, over? Yeah, they, we did rotations. Mm -hmm. But it was after, it was post-war. So you don't really get credit for it. So we would do rotations, all the Patriot mm -hmm. uh, units were doing rotations in Saudi Arabia. Um, but it wasn't considered a war, you know, per se. No, okay. Not, it was, was post-war. Mm -hmm. um, so. Were you stationed in Saudi Arabia? Um, just for deployment. I'm sorry? Just for undeployment. Okay. I wasn't really mm -hmm. stationed there. <sighs> and then um, I got married in August 15th of two, 1992 okay. to the guy I got engaged to. <laughs> All right. And was this down in Texas? No, we got married in uh, Dunkirk, New York which is right next door to Fredonia, New York, where I went to high school. And we had, um, he was from Nebraska, or is from Nebraska. Okay. How long were you stationed in Fort Bliss? Um, I got, I finished my tour, my initial tour, mm -hmm. and uh, got off active duty on uh, November 12th, 1992. Um, at that time, I went to work for uh, a Procter & Gamble chemical company called J.T. Baker mm -hmm. in, as a technical rep, techno sales rep in Charlotte, North Carolina, and joined the reserves immediately. Tell us what happened next. I got pregnant. <laughs> you got pregnant, okay. <laughs> With my um, amazing daughter, Jordan. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my ex-husband, he didn't get out as soon as I did. Like He, he had more obligation than I did. Um, so he got out probably five months after I did. And um, then we, he went in law enforcement and um, I stayed working in the chemical company, but my reserve unit was a uh, Lane's training unit mm -hmm. out of Fort Gordon, Georgia. Um, so we, I would drive down there uh, for battle or drill. And um, I was an observer controller for the training. Are you still a lieutenant? Um, I was a lieutenant. Um, when I got off active duty, um, the unit, that, the 143, was going back to Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and they took my records with them. So my records never got to Human Resource Command. Um, and so when I went to go before the 03 board, um, they didn't have my records and I wasn't promoted. Um, I did do a board of corrections and um, filed all my paperwork that I had saved copies of and reconstructed my records and um, they, I, they promoted me and then they backdated my rank. But it took me about 18 months to fight it. Okay, you're now a captain in the reserves. Yes. Um, go ahead. <laughs> and I, so I had my daughter mm -hmm. and I got pregnant fairly shortly thereafter with my son, Joshua. And uh, my company got bought by a competitor, mm -hmm. and they asked me to move to Boston. And um, at that time, my ex-husband wasn't real thrilled with his job in law enforcement in, in, the, in Charlotte. It was pretty dangerous. Um, I wanted to go back to school, so we decided to move here. Um, we settled in Marion, bought the house that I live in now. 
and he went back to school and I continued working for the company. Um, at that point, I transferred reserve units to um, the one, the first of the 98th Training Brigade out of Providence, Rhode Island. Um, it was a drill sergeant basic training unit. And I was um, initially in their S1, which is, I think I was the worst performance of any soldier ever. I was horrible at it. <laughs> Absolutely horrible. Completely unsuited for it. I don't, but it was a position, so I took it. Um, but I was only there in that role for about eight months before they asked me to be the headquarters company commander. And so for almost three years, I was the headquarters company commander for the one first of the 98th training division and did a couple of missions at Fort Leonard Wood um, commanding tr basic training companies. And this is, you know, the world was very quiet then. Yeah. So you were commanding a, a commanding officer. Correct. For basic training. For a headquarters company of a brigade mm -hmm. that did basic training. What's that like doing basic training from the other side? <laughs> I mean, it was funny though. The first time I was there for it, it was, it, you know, you kind of had to chuckle because you'd watch these soldiers doing stupid stuff and you know that you did it when you were there. You know you had to. <laughs> you know you looked as silly as they did and, you know, made mm -hmm. silly mistakes like they were making. And so it was kind of, um, I don't know, it wasn't payback because I wouldn't, I'm not vindictive. <laughs> But um, it was interesting. It definitely was the flip side of the coin, for sure. Mm -hmm. And toward uh, now we're going into the mid to late 90s, did you see attitudes toward women in the military change, or were they pretty much the same? Depends on who you were working with. Okay. Um, you know, I think the older, older soldiers still were in that mindset. Um, but the younger soldiers were more um, representative of of society. I mean, I think, you know, the Army is a cross-section of society and um, the attitudes of the soldiers um, represent that society. And I, I just think like the older soldiers that I served with, my boss, you know, the, the colonel mm -hmm. and the command sergeant majors and the senior NCOs, um, yeah, they were still a little bit, well, back in my day in the Army, we didn't have <laughs> women. and. Um, had this one warrant officer who, um, he was our food service officer and he was extremely overweight. And I kept putting him on a scale and he kept calling me cupcake. And I said, you can call me whatever you want, you're still getting on that scale. Because <laughs> you're fat and you're not meeting the Army standard. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was, it was interesting. It was an interesting um, dynamic because as a headquarters company commander, most of the people that I commanded outranked me. So. Well, the warrant officer didn't, but you know, he was a warrant officer five. You don't see them very often. Okay. Let's jump a little bit ahead. September 11, 2001. What were you doing? So I had, um, between my company command, I was a S3 of a signal battalion, a training signal battalion. And then when I completed that tenure, I went to U.S. Space Command. Um, and I was managing DOD apportionation of satellite capacity, commercial satellite capacity that we would lease on an annual basis. And I was managing who got capacity and who didn't. Um, so I was an um, what they call an individual mobilization augmentee, um, a drilling one. And they pulled myself and three or four other signal soldiers that were in the same category as I was on active duty. And the minute we got there, they said, you're involuntarily extended un indefinitely. You're in the army now. Yeah. So I had by this time I was divorced. Um, my kids were with my father, so um, he was retired. So I had to convince him that he needed to stay with them while I. And if it was going to go too long, I would have pulled them. I would have pulled them to Colorado, but um, it was only ended up being four months. Mm -hmm. But I spent um, the invasion on Baghdad, uh, September 11th. This is post September 11th. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I was I was not on duty the day of the bombings of the um, September 11th, I was in my civilian capacity. Okay. But it was shortly thereafter that, um, you know, everything got spun up and... <laughs> they yeah. went, yoo-hoo! <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I spent the invasion of Baghdad and Cheyenne Mountain 
watching the war on um, Blue Force Tracker, which is the um, every vehicle has a system in it so we can keep track of um, and communicate with each other and stuff like that, but um, basically watching it, making sure that there wasn't any jamming um, of the Blue Force Tracker system. We did a lot of uh, green on green jamming, uh, unintentional jamming. Uh, there was some other jamming issues um, associated with what was going on. Um, Saddam's force did have satellite jammers, so we were working issues with that, ComSec changeover, things like that. But um, pretty much 12 hours on a day. Um, I think every like four days uh, you would get, I would get a day off, four or five days I would get a day off. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was for four months during the initial assault in Baghdad. And my ex-husband, um, he was still, he was in the uh, Massachusetts National Guard at the time, military policeman, and he went to um, Iraq, I think, I want to say May to December of that year. So he was gone. Um, At that time. So you're in Cheyenne Mountain, Wyoming? Uh, it's in uh, Colorado. Colorado, okay, thank you. Keeping Saddam from jamming everything in sight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was your rank at the uh, I was a major. You're, not, you're now a major. Mm -hmm. I got okay. promoted to, uh, during my tenure as uh, the battalion S3. Mm -hmm. I started out as a senior captain and then got promoted shortly thereafter. And we're now talking 2002, 2003? 2003. Okay. 2003. Tell us what happened next. Um, so I stayed with um, Space Command for another two years. Um, they be became part of U.S. STRATCOM at that point. Um, and the whole headquarters moved to um, Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. And so I was flying out still to do my duty. Um, the job changed a lot, though, at that point, and I was making the decision whether I didn't really want to say stay completely signal because I didn't think there was a lot of career options. So I was deciding whether I was going to go space specialty or information operations specialty, and I chose information operations. So this is now 2004, um, and I went to the Northeast. Information Operations Command, which is at Devons, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And I was there for three months and was told I was being um, mobilized to go to Iraq. So that was the fall of 2004. Um, I started doing some training in early 2005. They said, oh no, we don't need you. I said, okay. Um, and then the next team that went out the door, they said, hey, we do need you. We're sending you with this team that you don't know from a different unit. Um, and so I had gone to my um, functional area 30 information operations school. Um, I had also gone to military deception school, um, operation security planner school, and a bunch of electronic warfare um, and cyber. So I've been to, I've been to all this, the proper schools. Um, and so in September 2005, I was mobilized for 20 months. And I did train up at first information operations command at Fort Belvoir from September through the end of December. And where is Fort Belvoir? It's outside of, it's in Alexandria, Virginia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right outside DC. Um, and then first, the 2nd of January, I flew to um, Fort Bliss to what they call CRC. What does that stand for? Command Replacement Center, mm -hmm. I think where they send individuals to replace other people. Um, and so my myself and my team went to Fort Bliss and then on to Iraq through Kuwait. All righty, you're off to Iraq. So I spent 2006 in Iraq. And where in Iraq? Um, I was in Afal Palace in Baghdad. So at Camp we were Victory. In... <laughs> and I was the um, lead information operations planner for um, Multinational Corps, Iraq. And what were you do? What were your duties? 
Um, so I was a, a planner. Mm -hmm. So any any exercise, because information operations kind of goes across operations, any exercise that was um, from current operations through six months out that was going through planning, I would be participating in. Mm -hmm. Or one of my soldiers that worked for me. Are you a colonel yet or still a major? I was a major. Still um, a major, okay. The, actually, the, the team lead was actually a lieutenant colonel mm -hmm. um, who... <laughs> God, he was a mess. Um, he just, he was, he was so incompetent. He fell out about, I guess in February, he had hurt his back or something, and they sent him back to Longshore for, mm -hmm. for treatment. And I don't know what he did there, but he ended up staying in Germany for like a month. And they said, you're fine, they sent him back. But at that point he was marginalized, so he just kind of sat in the corner and colored, as they say. And um, I led the team starting mm -hmm. then. Uh, he went on R and R in June. He went on his um, two weeks home, and he never returned. He was actually AWOL. Mm -hmm. And um, you're like, Major McLaughlin, where's your colonel? And I'm, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So anyway, so I officially took over the team at that point, um, and then they sent us a, a captain from First Information Operations Command to take his place. Whew. <laughs> But I was working a lot with the Marines mm -hmm. in Ambar province, um, and also up in, in Mosul and the, around the Haditha Dam on some operations, influencing operations. Mm -hmm. um, I was also working with um, my one-star general on his engagements, um, where he would go out and meet um, different leaders within mm -hmm. the Iraqi government. Um, I worked with the Minister of the Interior on trying to learn how to talk to his population and do public information. Um, he never quite got that, actually. But, and then we were working well. We had, there was a couple uh -huh. ops that I can talk about. There's many mm -hmm. I can't, um, but there was one that I would con uh, call like um, Kids Against Violence, like kind of like SAD, Students Against Drunk Driving, where uh, we were helping the Iraqi police get um, more acceptance and support within their population and they were working with the school schools and the school students um, to denounce violence so to report it if you see somebody digging an IED hole to report it if you see someone with arms that they're not supposed to have to report it and stuff like that and we touched 250,000 students within Iraq uh, with this program and it was fairly successful mm -hmm. um, our our metrics were um, very good as far as showing some kind of effectiveness of the program. So that was one, and we worked on another one where, um, so Saddam used to um, to pro prohibit the date palm far farmers from spraying for this little weevil um, beetle mm -hmm. that used to eat all the dates, and it's a huge um, part of their economy in Iraq. So they think they're next to California, the second largest date producer in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but this particular beetle had infested all the groves and um, they couldn't harvest. So we did the date palm spraying for the first time for to help the, promote the economic um, ability for the farmers to make money. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the programs that we worked on too. Mm -hmm. And it was really just informing the population that we're doing it to stay indoors during the time that so they don't get exposed, that it's not us gassing them, that we actually, this is good, this, <laughs> this is a positive is good, yeah. thing. Um, so a lot of public information type of stuff. So uh, judging from what you've just described, uh, you were kind of also kind of out and about oh, yeah. among the Iraqi population. What was that like? Um, I think it, it being a woman is particularly interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Meeting with the, the the senior leadership was harder. Um, there, you know, they would sometimes talk to my interpreter like he had some kind of decision authority, and I'd have to keep saying, no, no, "Here, right here, mm -hmm. not not him. He's, you know, he's just, you know, when I open my mouth, his mouth should be opening. <laughs> That's it. Mm -hmm. I make all the decisions here. Um, so that was hard because it was just they, you know, they don't, they're not used to women in a position of authority, even when you're in uniform. Um, so that was. Uh, 
you know, convincing them that they had to deal with me because that was all there, or or they weren't going to get the support that they were looking for. Um, so that was interesting. Walking around the streets, um, I had a lot of women touch me, which was interesting because you weren't sure if they're friend or foe. Um, but they would definitely come up and touch you and, you know, pat you and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't speak Arabic, um, so I have no idea what they were actually saying to me. They could have been calling me a, a terrible thing. <laughs> I would never know. <laughs> you were men just mentioning a uniform. Uh, were you wearing, like, the full... Oh, yeah, you oh, had yeah. to. Mm -hmm. You had to. Um, so 2000, 2006 was a pretty violent year in Iraq. Um, it was when the Golden Moss bombing happened. Um, a lot of progress that they had made went kind of backwards when that happened. Um, and the IEDs and the, um, the EFPs, they called them, which were a little bit more stronger IEDs, um, were you know, very prevalently used during that time. Um, so yeah, so when you went out, you were in, uh, I think I weighed, I had lost a lot of weight while I was there, cause, you know, it's so hot, you don't want to eat. And plus I'm walking everywhere. Like my, my can where I lived to my work was in mile. So I'd walk a mile and then from our, where we worked to the dining facility was half a mile. So given any day, I, a minimum six mile walk. And then I would, was working out and doing um, physical training, PT mm -hmm. on top of it. Um, but I was really thin. So I finally had bought myself a scale because I was a little worried about my weight. Um, at one point during the, I had on drugstore.com had it sent, and I was a little worried because I had lost a lot. I was I was starting to really notice that I had lost so much weight, and um, so I got on the scale and I weighed like 116 or something like that, and then I got off and I put all my gear on <laughs> and I got back on the scale and it ended up weighing about 65 pounds. Wow! So it was double me or half me I should say mm -hmm. um, that I would wear, but you know your your helmet your your vest, the plates, the shoulder dap, the daps. Um, you had something that would come down here to protect your femoral artery. Um, and then you had your weapon and your basic load of ammunition and your first aid kit. And <laughs> it just, you know, like you're walking <laughs> like the Michelin man a little bit. But, mm -hmm. um, but whenever you went out um, in a convoy or on a, you know, going out to, on a patrol or whatever, you had to wear that. Mm -hmm. and. It, um, we were expected to keep it on during the meetings too, just in case there's a bomber or um, yeah, kidnappings happen quite a bit too. Mm -hmm. Especially, that was the biggest concern when I was meeting with the Minister of the Interior. One time when we were there, there was a kidnapping of one of the, their officials in the same building. So that was interesting. Yeah. Woo! But I got to see a lot of Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, my one star general, General Horn, like to go out and visit, and he liked to have me with him. <laughs> um, I never could figure out why. I think I was the only one that didn't tell him no. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, you were a bit lower rank at the time. Yeah, like I really couldn't have said no. But okay. like, between between him and myself, there was a couple lieutenant colonels and a you know a couple <laughs> colonels. So, <laughs> and as far as uh, the you know camp life was concerned, uh, were you able to communicate with your family? Um, so it was, it was um, you really weren't supposed to have cell phones because mm -hmm. we, we knew that there were compromised. The cell phone network in Iraq was compromised, um, the civilian one. And uh -huh. so they really didn't want you to have one, but I did have one. Um, and I w would keep it on only in case of an emergency. My kids mm -hmm. only knew to call me if there was a, an emergency, which there was a couple, um, one in particular. and. But the most part, it would be um, via email, or I would call them at a predetermined time. Um, a couple of the operations that I was working on um, were military deception programs, and I had to get approval from the CENTCOM commander to do them. So I did end up coming back to the U.S. to brief him. Um, so when I was in the U.S., I didn't get to see my kids, um, except for when I went on R&R &R in September of that year. Um, I would at least be able to talk to them, um, and um, yeah, that was really before FaceTime came right. out. <laughs> uh -huh. Skype, Skype, I think was just coming out at the uh -huh. time. So, and as as far as you mentioning the weight loss, but um, was 
camp life okay? Was it, uh, did you It was have boring. I boring. mean, there really wasn't, I was working 17, 18 hour days. Um, when I wasn't even, when I, when I was traveling, sometimes there'd be a, a sandstorm and you'd get stuck in the middle of nowhere. Um, luckily, you know, hopefully you brought, you know, some food with you, <laughs> memory or something. <laughs> Um, but there really wasn't, you know, minus working out and maybe watching a movie here or there. There really wasn't much to do. Like I know my roommate had a social life. Um, it was kind of, I, I'm like, I don't know how you do it. She, her, her work schedule was a lot different than mine, mm -hmm. but, um, she was, um, she's still in the service. Um, she's a great woman, uh, Colonel D. God, Godfrey. Um, but she, she would go out country line da dancing and go to all the concerts MWR put on. And I don't, like, I don't know how she had the time to do it, but she did. You know, <laughs> so she had a social life while we were there, but I didn't. Because mm -hmm. um, I, you know, was, I was working too much. And then when I wasn't working, there was, I was trying to finish my, um, one of my schooling to become a lieutenant colonel um, while I was there. Um, intermediate learning, uh, ILE. And... Um, so there, yeah, there was writing papers after I got off duty, sitting at my desk. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so it was really boring. Oh. <laughs> there wasn't much to do. <laughs> but I mean, you know, like I, it was fun because you, you, you know, the thing about deployment is everybody's deployment's different, and it's the people that you're there with that make it. Um, and I had a great team. Once our lieutenant colonel went away, <laughs> went AWOL. Um, oh dear. Yeah, it was embarrassing. It was an embarrassment. But um, yeah, there, so it wasn't. You know, I read a lot. Uh -huh. yeah. And you were. In, how long were you stationed in Iraq? Twelve months. Twelve months. So we're going on into January. The whole, the whole year, two thousand six. Okay, so January two thousand seven. You are back at Fort Belvoir. Mm -hmm. um, they my twenty months hadn't finished, so I was at Belvoir for January, February, and March of two thousand and seven. Um, during that time, we were training up the, ne the teams that were going out the door next. Um, and I w had the opportunity to go to Oberammergau, Germany, um, and teach at the NATO school. Mm -hmm. So I taught information operations, uh, a course at the NATO school in um, Bavaria, Germany. Um, that, was very, that was very fun. Um, that was a really good time. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, <laughs> well, it was. It was. It was not just the the fact that we I could actually have a beer um, for the first time in uh, you know how long. It was uh, just the experience of being with the coalition forces, mm -hmm. and in my small group breakout, I had people from Croatia, Spain, Italy, the Netherlands, Denmark, um, Germany. It was just really. It was quite unique experience. So. And then what happened after that? So I went back to, um, came back home, mm -hmm. and at that point I w was uh, selected to command the first information operations uh, reserve element and got promoted to let Lieutenant Colonel Early as a result of it. Um, so I was probably a year ahead of when I should have been promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. and. Um, so I would go down to Fort Belvoir for my battle of some, for my, my drills, um, and then um, went back to work. For, I was working for a contract manufacturing organization in biotech. Like my civilian career, I switched over to biotech after mm -hmm. I worked for J.T. Baker, and um, so I was working for, and it was a British biotech company, and they didn't save my job. So they hired two people to replace me. And so when I came back, I don't think they expected me to come back. And I'm like, all right, I'm here, guys. Where's my job? And they're like, oh, we don't have a job for you. So I worked for them from April through probably August. And they gave me a severance to keep me quiet and not sue them. Um, so they gave me a pretty decent severance. But it was, you know, it takes a while to find a new job. Um, and so I, it, you know, I went to work for um, a consulting company for a while and did consulting. And then... Um, in April of 2008, I um, started working for a biotech company from Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. um, doing business development sales, basically. Um, at that time, I was still at the, um, I was still at First IO Command, and then at about the same time, actually, I got selected to be a battalion commander of the 301st IO Battalion 
at Fort um, Taunton, New York. And so, um, I'm missing, I'm missing an assignment in there. Okay, so between 1st I.O. Command okay. and mm -hmm. when I got selected for Battalion Command, mm -hmm. I went to work for um, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency mm -hmm. at Fort Belvoir um, and was their lead I.O. planner and wrote the I.O. portion of their um, plans to protect the homeland um, and to um, counter proliferation of weapons of mass destruction globally. So I wrote the I.O. plan for that part, mm -hmm. of their, for their overall plans. Um, and I was only with them for about eight months. I, I did some work with their commander um, who was um, testifying in front of Congress, and so I helped write some of his congressional um, testimony. Um, and then, like I said, that it was only eight months, and then I got selected for battalion command, mm -hmm. which I loved being a battalion commander. And we, it, was, it was a new unit. I was the first commander. So I had to build the organization. Um, but we were sending soldiers to Afghanistan um, within six months of me taking command. So we were pretty successful in getting everybody ramped up. Um, and for myself, for my own missions, I was doing a lot of um, exercise work with UCOM at the time, European Command. So they have a annual, couple of annual exercises, and I was there um, helping them out with being their lead planner for those exercises um, for my own duty. And then I, I went to Kuwait in 2010. Um, that was the last year I was in command um, and did an exercise there and helped write a couple plans that are associated with the surrounding countries um, from Kuwait. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, some that are uh, I've seen implemented today. So. Okay. Um, from Battalion Command, um, I was still working. I was still working for the company in Oklahoma. Um, they I helped them raise um, a round of financing, and they um, changed a bunch of stuff around. And so I left the company because it was just time. I went to work for a Canadian company developing um, technology for manufacturing therapeutic monoclonal antibodies for drugs. Um, my degree, mm -hmm. I never told you this, but my, my bachelor's degree was in biology. Okay. Um, and then I have a master's in adult education, um, a master's in organizational leadership, and a master's from the War College in strategic studies. I was trying to get my PhD, but I mm -hmm. couldn't. It ran out of time, and so they kicked me out of the program. <laughs> it was um, you know, too many deployments, too many um, having to go to war college and do that at the same time was too much, mm. I, so I couldn't finish it. So after battalion command, I went to go work for the Joint Enabling Capabilities Command, which is a joint um, unit at Norfolk, Virginia, um, at the Norfolk Naval Base. And their mission, they have three different subdivisions, and I was in the joint planning support element. And the mission was in the event that there was something that went on globally and they had to set up a joint task force, this unit would send this joint task force staff to the forwardly deployed area um, and get things going and starting and running um, up to 90 days. And at that point, then the, the combatant commander would have to backfill the team um, with his own people or her own people and at that point then we would redeploy. So I was with them for 10 months. I was on two of the teams that were ready to go. Um, I was about to go um, to fill one of these these roles and I got picked up for 06 um, to Colonel and also Brigade Command. So I actually commanded the brigade that my battalion was in when I was a battalion commander. So um, after three years, you know, battalion command was three years, they changed it, so it was supposed to be a two-year tenure. So I took over brigade command in February of 2013 and commanded a brigade from 2013, February 2013, till just this past August. Wow. So they extended me in command six months. Um, we sent at least 10 teams a year. Um, 
to support other joint task force and other commands uh, doing information operation planning and operations uh, to include cyber. So that, that was the mission of my brigade and um, had very successful command. Mm -hmm. Not to mention busy. Yeah, I was very busy. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you doing these days? So I took a position with the 311th Theater Signal Command out of PACOM, out of Pacific Command. Um, I'm their senior reservist. The commander, uh, Major General Brock, is a USAR soldier, but as a, a general officer, they pull you back and forth as much as they need it, as they need. Um, but so I, I joined them the end of August. Um, spent some time in Hawaii in September, kind of getting to know the, the mission of the unit. And then um, we'll be going to, well, I was like in California this past weekend. Um, the actual headquarters of the unit is in California, in Orange County. So getting back to my signal roots, because uh -huh. I kind of, I was kind of at the top of the food chain for information operations. Um, and information, I mean, I, I don't know how much you know about information operations, probably nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So information operations has um, been around for probably about 15, 20 years, maybe, fi maybe 15, more 15. Mm -hmm. I've been in it for 10, so yeah, about 15. And it really was, um, the whole concept of it is controlling information on the battlefield, um, keeping it from the enemy, um, getting uh, our commanders information that's timely and accurate. Um, and the whole p purpose is so that our commanders can make good, good decisions while influencing our enemies to make bad decisions or decisions we want them to make. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of influencing operations. It's also um, changing public perception, changing public um, attitude, mm -hmm. um, getting them to support certain activities that we might be doing and denouncing the activities of the people we don't want them to be supporting. Um, as part of that is um, using psychological warfare. Um, so I have some expertise in psychological warfare. Um, military deception is actually my specialty within IO. So using deception on the battlefield to give an advantage to our commanders. Um, a lot of, I did a lot of that while I was away. Um, I actually still am involved in some um, stuff with that. <laughs> um, operation security, so restricting the amount of information that we give that's not classified but just sensitive information to the enemy. And part of that is looking at how vulnerable are we to being collected on and figuring out a way how we can resolve those vulnerabilities and keep the enemy from gaining information about ourselves. Whether it's keeping soldiers from talking about stuff they're not supposed to, to uniform, I mean there's all, way, all kinds of ways that um, you know, intelligence guys can, can collect, I mean, we do the same thing, so um, it's just trying to restrict that, um, their access to that information. And then public information, because public affairs, everyone says that's public affairs, well it's not. Public affairs only targets U.S. audiences. We can't target U.S. audiences. We target everybody else. And so local population, getting them to be informed, you know, like, we're going to blow up this ammo supply depot. You need to leave the area. That's something we would do versus public affairs because um, it's not a U.S. audience. And then um, the cyber elements of it, computer network operations, computer defense, um, using cyber as a way to deliver psychological warfare messages to a particular audience. So if you have a um, Islamic extreme website or something like that, um, for example, um, collecting on that and then maybe manipulating the information a little bit um, or taking the website down. Right. So those, those are the kind of, I mean, this is all kind of open source information. Mm -hmm. I'm not um, saying anything that's classified. Um, but that's, so it's kind of the whole combination and synchronizing all those efforts and so that, and making sure that they're in the plans for, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that you, instead of going straight to a kinetic um, solution of blowing something up, we can influence thing, the situation so that we can get the same effect without going to a lethal mm -hmm. save lives type of thing. <laughs> so you're heading out to California at some point? Yeah, so I'll be going out there for my battle assemblies um, you know, on a, pretty much on a monthly basis. Uh -huh. um, 
and then um, I've been right now I'm looking at whether or not they really need me and I'm not sure okay so I'm looking at other options as well. All right. Well, <laughs> some of them are not in the U.S. <laughs> oh, okay, why not? So, uh, as a, have your children expressed interest in joining the military? Uh, they were very much for it, having both parents in the military. Um, but I think when my ex went to Iraq and then I was gone for so long, my, mine was excessive. Twenty months is excessive. Um, my son, in particular, my youngest. He was all about going to West Point or Norwich or someplace like that. And when I came back, he's like, there's no way. Mm -hmm. There's no way I would put anybody through what you put me through, Mom. Oh, dear. <laughs> so he's very anti-military. Um, and um, my daughter's just very extremely liberal. Um, she wants to work for the State Department, maybe USAID. Um, she's in Switzerland right now getting her. She graduated from University of Vermont um, oh, cool. last year. And she's in Switzerland now um, getting her master's degree in um, public policy and international politics. Interesting kids. Yeah. <laughs> and my son's at UMass Boston. Yeah. Mm, bacon. He's a beacon. <laughs> I, w I got one of my master's there. Uh-huh. Well, you certainly ha have been keeping and keeping very, very active in the military. Do you see yourself in the military for a few more years at least? Yes. Um, well, so kind of funny thing happened. Um, I, w I was told I was eligible to give my children my GI Bill benefits, and so I did. Mm -hmm. And I incurred an obligation to the military as a result of it, and then they declined their claim. <laughs> so I'm in the middle of fighting that whole system right now. Oh, dear. Because um, I used my GI Bill to pay for my education, but it was only, it was a different, it was a Montgomery Reserve, it was a different, a different type, and so I, I'm, I think that there's, um, they need to make an, either a change to their policy on it, or um, I, anyway, I'm going to fight it. I'm going to take it as far as I can go because okay. I think it's inappropriate. Um, you know, they, to be a colonel, I have to have a master's degree, and the the GI Bill benefits don't even provide you enough benefits to get a master's degree. So there's a disconnect in mm. what the army want, and military wants you to have as an officer, and what they're benefits you're giving you. So there's definitely a disconnect. Right. So um, I think it's not just for myself and my own kids, but for mm -hmm. the other soldiers and, and servicemen and women. You, okay, you were just mentioning the GI Bill. Being a Massachusetts resident, have you been taking advantage of some of the programs and other benefits being offered? Well, I mean, my, my master's degree that I did get mm -hmm. from UMass Boston, I, didn't, I only had to pay student fees. So mm -hmm. that was good. And uh, what do you know about the Mass Women Veterans Network? So I just discovered them recently. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and I participated in a um, retreat in uh, last month in October down in Lakeville, and it was lovely. Um, it was great to meet these really interesting, um, really dynamic, very successful women. Um, some of these women are, you know, they were in the Army, you know, the WAC. They were, they were, they were in the army when the army was just starting out, and they weren't. There were a lot of nurses. The older, older um, veterans were a lot of more nurses or medical, but some of them were hardcore, you know, women's army corps. Mm -hmm. um, so they were really impressive um, and very neat. And I love to hear their stories and what they, you know, they experienced back when in the late 60s, 70s. It was just crazy stuff. But yeah, so I, I think I will try to um, play a more active role in that organization now that I've discovered them. Um, and uh, you know, like I said, I, it's just recent that I, I have, so I'm just starting out. But I'll be in the Army until, with my obligation that I have, my mandatory retirement date is June of 19, um, excuse me, 2019, unless I get promoted to 07, to uh, G uh, Brigadier General. Um, I went before the Brigadier General Board, Selection Board, in October. Um, I have no idea the results. I can't get anyone to tell me what they're looking for. <laughs> so I have no idea if I'm even close. Um, you know, it's, in a lot of it they say, oh, it's who you know. And um, unfortunately, with information operations, I'm very well known within information operations, but outside of that specialty, I'm not very well known. Like, people don't know who I am because mm -hmm. it's, you know, we work with, we work with a lot of the special forces groups. So I'm not in the mainstream army very much. 
and so that's probably going to hinder my my selection to to general. Well, I hope not. Well, I'm not sure. We'll see. Yeah. Like I said, I have no idea what their selection criteria is, um, or what they're uh -huh. looking for. Or do they need a you know mm -hmm. someone who has non-lethal, non-kinetic cyber mm -hmm. background, or 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 not? I don't know. Molly, have you joined any other organizations such as the Legion or VFW, or have you just? So I, um, I have to remember which one it is. So I was at Alumni Weekend at Norwich because I'm on the Board of Fellows. So mm -hmm. I was there for a Board of Fellows meeting, and I stayed for the football game on Saturday. And some classmates of mine had started, I think it's a VFW, <laughs> um, <laughs> a post-1819, that's the year that Norwich was uh, founded, and they talked me into joining. So, um, so just that October. <laughs> Just, I just got confirmed as a member. Okay. <laughs> officially. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, I haven't done anything with them at all, so. Mm -hmm. um, what has serving in the military meant for you? You know, I think it's, um, like I said, I knew early on that I, I felt an obligation mm -hmm. to serve. Um, and every, every time I go away for one of my deployments anywhere in the world, or even when I, because I travel extensively internationally for my civilian job in biotech, um, I reaffirm that America is the best place in the world, mm -hmm. and our freedom is worth making sacrifices of my own personal freedom um, because it's not free. We have to fight for it, and I think that we're um, getting to a stage in our in in our global history where it's going to become even more um, relevant that we stay in the fight and that we keep our borders safe and our, our, our civilian um, population safe because it's not, you know, ISIS isn't going away. And if ISIS goes away, there'll be somebody else, um, XYZ terrorist organization. Um, asymmetrical warfare is here to stay. It's effective. They, they know they can take us. Um, out with very um, specific targeting of specific, um, I, they would call them high payoff targets, and um, you know they're not going away. And I'm I'm here until they say you're, you're too old <laughs> um, to continue that fight because it, it is real. It's a real threat. And I think for what I do as a non-lethal influencing op expert in the army my role and people like me is going to increase um, to combat the asymmetrical mm -hmm. nature of our, of our threat. So, I mean, for me, it, it has meant, I, I just see the need for it. And if not, like I had someone, back when you could travel in uniform, I was getting a rental car um, in uniform, and this woman came up to me and said, you're so pretty, why are you in the military? Why would you do that to yourself? And I said, well, if not me, who? Who would? Mm -hmm. you, are you going to do it? Well, no, God, I would never join the military. Well, then who's going to do it? Who's going to protect you? I don't think that was the reaction she expected. Um, but I was just, I was offended by her um, completely. And it's just, you know, it, it is, it's real. We have, we have to keep them on the run. We have to protect our, our civilians. We have to protect our future. And there's, you know, whether it's an economic threat, uh, a global economy threat, or whether it's a physical um, attacks on in, in our our land, on our, you know, in our country, in our borders, it's it's there, and it's going to happen again. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's not just a, but you know, it's, it. I know everybody's focused on the, the Muslim extremists now because of what's just happened in, in Paris and everything, but it's not just the Muslim extremists. Mm -hmm. There are other, there's other threats, um, and Americans have a very short memory, and they forget September 11th. There's a generation of school kids that have no idea what it is. You know, they're not being reminded of it, um, but it's going to happen again. Mm -hmm. um, and I will serve until I can't mm -hmm. to help prevent it, mm -hmm. stop it whatever I can do. Okay. Well, Colonel Molly McLaughlin, we thank you so much for coming in and interviewing for the Veterans Oral History Project. Yeah, you're quite welcome. Thank okay. you for having me. Mm -hmm.